All right, everybody, and welcome to the black and white category uh, award judging announcement. I would start off by showing you some comparisons of what I would like to have in a black and white image. However, I'm going to tell you right now that the, the top five in this category are so incredibly good that there is a there is nothing I have to add to this category by putting my own work into this video. So we're going to start here with this picture of what I assume is the side of a ship based on the porthole and the rivets and the general corrosion in the metal and what looks like a fishing net or hammock and then another uh, another rope. And there's a lot of really good and interesting composition going on in this shot. The shot uses a lot of intersecting angled lines. So you can see the lower rope comes in from the right downward. The hammock or the net comes in from the upper right downward. The shadows behind them, which are also being cast on them, come in from the top left and move downward. That creates this X formation in the image. And then the open space between the hammock and the rope or the net and the rope sort of traps your image on this incredibly dark porthole. Like what is on the other side of it? Obviously not a room with a light that's on, um, but that complete blackness there in stark contrast to the lighter tones of the rest of the image is really good. So if we're going to talk about what one factor kept this out of the top five, because this is one, this, when I, when I judged these, you know, I, I think I said in some of the previous videos, I took all the ones that when I looked at them and the file explorer just jumped off the, the screen at me. And this was in the original batch that I would have said would have been in the top five. There were eight or nine from this category that made it that far. What pulled this one back out is the uh, horizontal and vertical seams on the ship. So if you imagine taking this one and cropping it so that this horizontal line along the middle is level, then what happens is this bit of shadow that's currently up here at the top would probably get cropped out. And then this vertical line on the left with the rivets would then become more truly vertical, probably true vertical, as well as the hidden seams with the rivets as well, like around the porthole. And that crop would also tilt the image somewhat so that the diagonals would become even more diagonal. And it would emphasize that diagonal structure and it would build a whole bunch of triangles into the image composition. And that's something, triangles are really, really underrated for, um, for image composition. I think they're a really strong format for images, especially in a square format like this, because you can easily cut the format into four triangles, well, two and then four triangles, very simply. So building a square image around, triangu <clears throat> around triangular shapes is a really good way to give an, a very interesting composition to your work. This next one was another one that was originally in, in the top five batch. And if you're asking, why did this not make the top five? Just wait until you see the top five, because this is a really good shot. If, if you look at some of the technical things that are going on here, right? Firstly, the composition is solid. The, um, the subject focus is precise. So everything that's behind the subject is out of focus. The entire depth of the subject is in focus. Really perfect use of aperture for this image. The verticals are vertical. The lines in the background that are converging aren't askew. And also, I mean, there is maybe possibly one person cut off in back there in the white jumpsuit or hoodie, but it, none of the people who are distinguishable as people are cut off by the crop or by the framing, assuming that this is the full image. And so there's a really keen eye at work here in terms of not just image structure, but how to use a background that both sets the scene of the image, but isn't distracting. So uh, really, really good work. This was one that I went back and forth on a lot because I really enjoyed this photo. This next one is a really adorable, adorable dog. And this is a hard photo to get, a really, really hard photo to get. And I am, I am impressed by the level of skill in getting this image. The, the dog is, uh, looks like it's a black and white roan with a probably black, maybe dark brown. It could be a dark brown color. 
Uh, at any rate, significantly darker than the light that's on the floor next to it. So if you look at the nose and the, the gray, what, what is in this image, grayscale roan on the dog, that's perfectly exposed. Capturing the detail, any sort of detail at all, and there is a decent amount of detail in the dog's face where it is either dark brown or black, with this lighting is really solid technical skill. And if you look at what's really catching, at least my eye, with this image, are the way that light is used to highlight the shape of the dog's face in shadow and the ears. And that's really complementary to the overall structure of the dog. Now, the um, image composition is really solid as well. Just sent there are a lot of people who will harp on center placing subjects and with the right subject and the right photo, it's not in any way a problem to center place. And this is one of those examples where that really works well. So if there were anything that if I were given the opportunity to take this photo, if, if I had taken it and I had the opportunity to take it a second time, there are two things I would do a little bit differently with this shot. First is that the, uh, there is light coming in through the window from above. And that is a very, um, very bright light, much different lighting than, than what is ambient in the room where this photo was taken. I might either, if, if it's got drapes, like a, like a light colored drape, try to pull that over to, to soften the light a bit. Or if not, um, maybe some Venetian blinds that are tilted upward, although that would add texture to the light. And I'm not sure I would like that. Um, but something that would soften the light coming into the window, even if it was just hung temporarily, would do a lot to soften up the shadow of the dog that's in front of it. The other thing is, if you look in the background of the image, about 35, 40% of the way up from the bottom, you can see the molding on the wall. And the only reason I'm harping on that is because when I was in photo class, I took a picture of a person and the, the molding on the wall was visible as well as the electrical socket on the wall. And my professor had a conniption fit. So it is something I am always very mindful of now and uh, something that jumps off the, pay, uh, the image when I see it. But other than that, from, from a technical perspective with, with you know, those two really minor asterisks, really exceptionally well executed photo. So this one was is interesting to me because there's I can't tell if it's actually a photo that was taken in fog with ice on the grass or if this was heavily manipulated in post. The, it it could just be a super grainy film but realistically the 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 noise in it looks like a high iso image that's then been run through a filter to give it more noise. Um, in the bridge structure itself, it works really well. That whatever technique was used to give this image the texture that the, uh, that the areas, especially the darker areas of it have, that works beautifully on the bridge. The grassy area in the front has gone gray and it's sort of, it's, it's lost texture and it's lost detail. So there's not really anything you can do about that and keep this image the way it is. And, and I go back and forth as to whether that, that grassy grayness where there's been that loss of detail is a, is a deal breaker for me, but I think that the overall image is very captivating. And it looked at from far away, say across a room, I don't think that the, the grassy detail on it would really be a problem from a an appropriate viewing distance. And I do think that the, the way that the uh, bridge disappears into the fog is very well executed and the overall composition is very, very well done. And these are some things you're going to hear me say from a lot of these images, by the way, because the, the submissions for this category taken uh, as a whole were the best of all of the categories. This was the one I had the hardest time judging. Um, so you guys really across the board, do a, a really fantastic job with your black and white work. And the level of comments I have on them is, it, it's minor for every single image. Here's a really interesting shot of either rock or sand. I don't think it's snow. And it's a really good use of converging lines and texture. And if you look at the way that the lines fan out, 
from the upper left. Also, you get a little bit of uh, triangular shape to the lines, as we talked about earlier. That's a, it's a strong shape in images. A little bit harder to use in a rectangular image, but it can still work. Now, the thing is, that's basically what the photo is. It's pleasing to look at, um, but it's ultimately it's a, it's a, a, te a texture image. It's a very very good use of texture, but it but texture as an image is harder to pull off um, than it is using texture as an image element. And we'll see that we've seen that a couple times and already in this video. We'll see that a lot more where texture is used as an image element to complete the overall uh, meaning or the overall image aesthetic. So I also, ha in this image, really happen to like the use of the, the way that the dark lines contrast against the lighter areas. And I think that it is really interesting to look at the lines and try to figure out what the heck this is that was photographed. Because I also can't tell scale. Was this taken from an airplane? Or is this a macro photo? Or is it someone's backyard hardscape? I don't know. Uh, it's really fascinating for me to look at for those reasons. In some of the previous videos, I've said I have no problem with clever photos, and I have no problem with clever photos. I really loved how this image created a two-dimensional shadow with three-dimensional objects. And what it's doing is the camera angle, I've said it multiple times, have your horizontals and verticals level. This is an exception that shows a good use of having your camera off angle. Because what's happened here is that putting the camera off to the side like it is and tilting it downward, yes, it, it gives you a diagonal-ish, now an off horizontal line in the back, but it does something very important, which is show the three-dimensionality of the books and cameras and box that were used to project the shadow of the word love onto the wall. And so that creates a juxtaposition of three-dimensional objects and two-dimensional shadows, which from a meta discourse level is a really good uh, commentary on photography, which is where we look at a three-dimensional world and we take an image either on film or digital that is two-dimensional. And so the whole act of photography is converting a three-dimensional world into a two-dimensional representation, which is exactly what's going on in this image. And I found that to be very thought-provoking, very clever, and uh, I think that that was a really neat and intentional use of space and shape. Also really like the sepia to toning in this image. So here's a, a, an example of where um, texture is used very well because there are contrasting textures. There's the glass, which is, in theory, smooth. And then, of course, aged hands, which are decidedly not smooth. So two major contrasting textures there. Uh, the only, honestly, the only cr critique I would have of this image is to get a little bit closer. Because and if you look in the background, we've got a neck and a chin. And that's a, even though they're blurry, it's a bit distracting. So, and then there's some detail in the wall that you can kind of make out, like there's a window and maybe either a door or blinds or something like that. Kind of the blurry background kind of becomes a distracting element, making the viewer wonder what's going on back there. So if you imagine bringing this image down a little bit from the upper left corner so that the top of the frame is slightly above the glass, say maybe halfway between the glass and the, the, the chin, and then bringing the left frame in at the same time, maybe a little bit further from the left you, to change the aspect ratio a little bit, would then cut out some of the hand and the shirt. And if you look at the shirt where it's at the shoulder, that out of focus area becomes a little bit jittery with the way that the shirt's design is meshing with the way that the lens is transmitting light. And so, I mean, yes, it's another texture in the image, which is uh, an interesting juxtaposition again, but it doesn't feel like an intentional use of texture in the way that the hands and the glass do. 
And then the other thing would be um, to either try to crop this in that way and do a one-to-one -one aspect ratio, which would be square, or a four to five, four high, five across. So shooting it basically, uh, having a landscape orientation. And see how those two aspect ratios work with this photo because I think that they could really change the image presentation and amplify the subject focus. So um, one of the things, if you've, if, just as going out to everybody here, if you've never shot other formats, it's worth it to try cropping your images into other formats because different formats teach you to think differently about images. And uh, cropping your, your 35 millimeter frames into different format aspect ratios also helps to teach your brain to, focus, uh, to compose images with those different structures, and it will broaden your horizons in terms of creating images. Here's one that uh, I also really loved. And again, you can hear me say that a lot in this video because the, the quality of entries for this category were, was phenomenal. So uh, there's a lot going right in here. I like the choice of subject is fantastic. The, uh, the, the way that the, the subject is sitting, uh, either it's random or it's posed, doesn't matter. Good choice of taking the photo when they were sitting like that. Also, it looks like they're getting ready to start playing. I think it's really interesting to see them uh, taking care of their trumpet the way that they are. Plus, the, the subject is sitting on this cracked terrazzo with some peeling paint on the doorway behind them. And so there's a lot of really uh, visceral textures at play here. Plus, the subject's wearing white pants or light-colored pants that have translated as white dark shoes, and then a striped shirt. And so there's all kinds of contrasting shapes here. There's tons of triangles and rectangles and vertical-ish lines and things like that. So those are some things that, that are really going well here. And so if there were an opportunity to go back and retake this photo, the things that would be worth changing on it are minimal. And so as you, as you heard me say, if you've watched some of the previous videos. Photographer's pants and knees should be in bad condition. So looking at this photo, you can see that the camera was pointed downward. And you know that because of the key stoning in the verticals. So if you look at the pillar here on the left, it is pointed inward to the image. If you look over on the door, the verticals in the door are pointed inward to the image. So if, if there were an opportunity to retake this with a camera lower and level, so if you had the camera low, like let's say it was on plane with the trumpetist's elbow, really, really low, then what would happen is you'd have an even perspective across their entire body. So if you take a portrait of a person, let's say, and they're standing and you point the camera at their waist, you're going to get roughly the same amount of distance from the center of your lens to their head as to their feet. And that gives you a good even perspective of the person. So if you think of it in the same terms here, if the center of the camera was level with the ground and pointed at this guy's elbow, then his head and feet would be in the same, would have the same perspective and it would look very natural. Plus being a lower image, the verticals would be corrected because of the camera being level. And because the, the photo was physically taken lower, it would give it more drama and more, more interesting perspective. Most of the time when people see the world, they don't see it from down low. So images that are taken down low are inherently more interesting to us as viewers because it's a different perspective. A couple of other things that you would have been able to correct with that framing, if you had taken a half step to the right, you could have used your subject's hair to block out the stencil on the, the trash can. And the stencil is a little bit distracting here because it is right above his head. And also, just as a personal pet peeve, uh, I don't like having trash cans in the background, but if that stencil were covered, it would look like a mailbox. So, um, and it would be a less distracting element in the image because the stencil would be hidden. And then pausing three seconds before the image to let the people in the background uh, leave would have also isolated your subject within this scene really effectively and given the image a sense of the subject being isolated. Um, in terms of cropping it then, on the left side, I would bring the left side of the image in between this white triangle here and the edge of the step. 
you'd still have the subject's foot and then you'd go up the uh, the side there and then bring it over on the top. I, wherever that horizontal crop line met the top of that fence, just crop it there. Um, maybe a little bit higher if, if you lost some sort of, uh, you, you basically what you want to do is crop out this sign in the top middle above the trash can. So as long as your, your vertical line is between the top of the trash can and the bottom of that sign, you'll be fine in that, that crop. So, um, the important things are done really, really, really well here. And the things that are easy to, uh, to fix the next time this opportunity comes are easy to, to fix. So overall, exceptionally good image and really good uh, demonstration of image instinct and taking the photo at the right time. So here's a really pleasing silhouette that is timed beautifully. So if you look at the, uh, the silhouette, what in all probability your eyes will be drawn to is the kid playing in the reflection of the sunlight and the shadow of the kid being uh, following the same direction of the sunlight, of course, because that's how light works. So then the rest of the family becomes a part of the image. From a creative standpoint, that's really fantastic. I think that the structure of the image is really beautiful. The use of the shadow in the lower right corner does a wonderful job of keeping the viewer's eyes towards the silhouette family along the waterfront. And um, honestly, the sky being gray, doesn't in any way, shape, or form bother me. It's a technical limitation of the film. So all of that stuff, really good. The couple of things that are outside of the photographer's control in this image due solely to setting are the fact that the two adults have a jetty running through their head. That's really my only complaint with the image. Um, horizon is dead level. This image structure is beautiful. The, the tonal range, the use of tones in it, you know, conveys the idea that this is a sunset image, even though it's in black and white. That's really hard to do. Uh, so this was a really exceptionally well executed image. Here's one that I think might be in this entire video, maybe even in every image that's been submitted for this whole contest from a technical standpoint, the hardest to achieve. And you've got a dark black cat and a couple of more, and then a sunny background and chrome and black tires and a black leather bike seat. And so there's a huge tonal range in this image. And the blacks have shadow detail, tons and tons of shadow detail. And the chromes aren't super blown out. And, uh, there is a little bit of gray muddiness where the highlights, it looks like the highlights were pulled back a little bit too far and raw in the left side of lower left side of the image. Minor complaint, honestly, given the image aesthetic here, I think that that works fairly well. So, um, I mean, solid image and from a technical perspective, very, very hard to capture this exposure well. Here's another one that's really good, almost there, not quite, and that two simple changes could really uh, amplify this image. So use of lighting in this image, really fantastic. Bright window light, interior uh, sh shadow, but it's all really evenly balanced. So there are some blow out, blown out highlights in the window and on the couch. Honestly, not a huge deal. So um, from a technical perspective, really, really solid. Also a very good use of tonal range. And that was one of the things that I really was looking for in this category, by the way, was a really good use of tonal range. So this image had that in spades. Also really good image composition with some really good depth. You've got converging lines and the guitarist's legs, and then another one coming in from the guitar's neck and the guitarist's arms. And then you've got some really solid verticals and then the convergence of the couch and the, the coffee table. So all of that works together to keep the viewer's eyes on the subject. So really excellent in that regard. So what would I change here? There were a couple of really simple things. Uh, I would recrop the image slightly 
so that the bottom of the picture in the top left is not in frame. Solely because you, you see part of a picture is like, ooh, I wonder what the rest of that picture is. And now the subject isn't the focus of the image. The wondering of what that picture is becomes the focus. The second one is just saying to your subject, hey, uh, there's a blanket on the couch behind you. Can you just move your arm, knock it on the floor, we'll pick it up in a few minutes? Because the blanket has some text on it, which is distracting, but also because it's a different shape now than the rest of the couch in a different tone, it stands out and becomes distracting. So if, the, if you just had the couch shape, then um, that would be a, a little bit, it would, focus more on the subject than having the blanket there. And then of course the tree in the background coming out of the subject's head and the solution to that is just to step a step to the left so that the subject's head is not in front of the tree. So honestly, really minor things there that I would say, um, it, given the opportunity to take this photo again, could be changed. Very solid image. So I'm struggling with this one because I am 99.9% .9 certain I have stood in this spot. And I think I've walked out to the gate on that wharf, dock, no, pier, pier, that's a pier. Um, at any rate, I really enjoy the use of shape here. This is, um, so the scene is very pleasing. Horizon's very level. You've got a very minimalist scene, a sailboat and a bird and then the post a fence in the foreground to give some nice foreground interest and framing and a sense of depth. And then what's really interesting here is you've got this straight horizon line with the mountain range in the back. And then the curving of the uh, pier. Is that a... Yeah, because Jetty goes out on fill, pier goes out on stands or on posts. So yeah, that's got to be just a curving here. Um, I'm really hung up on what it is, sorry. The curve is really well executed here because it contrasts, there's nothing else that's round in the image. I mean, certainly, yes, the, the posts that it rests on and the post at the front that has that seagull on the top of it, those are round. But the way they're translated into this image, they're not. So the only round thing in this photo is the shape of, of the pier and the, everything else is a straight line. And so that's a really interesting use of form and shape to create visual interest within the image. All right, so here's a shot of a stairway going up into the sunlight. And this is an intrinsically hard subject to photograph. I like the use of texture here and I like the use of tone and contrast. I honestly don't even mind that the highlights up at the top of the stairs are completely blown out. I think that's a really good image element because that says there's no way of knowing what's up here. It's completely masked. There is, there is, uh, there is nothing that you can discern at the top of the stairs. And then at the bottom of the stairs, exactly the opposite. Well, I mean, exactly the same, but for the opposite reasons. There's nothing you can, can discern because it's completely lost into shadows. Um, so really great use of the full range of black and white tones in this image. And then the textures of the plants and the stone of the stairs and the absence of texture in the sky and the smoothness of the metal rail and the overall image composition being very vertical, I think suits this image uh, very well. It's a good structure for this image. So here's one that I found uh, to be a really, uh, really interesting image in terms of how, how the subjects are being conveyed. So this is when I mentioned the first time in this video, we're going to talk about texture a lot. This was actually the image that came to mind when I thought about that, because if you took a photo of four identical buildings, but they were clean and not weathered, it would be an incredibly boring photo. So I think that this is a really neat one because the dirt on the siding, the age of the wood siding, the, wo the wood being so old that it is not holding paint anymore, the bricks in the, in the chimney in the first building, the, the, the different shingles, looks like two or three different types of shingles in the roofs, the broken windows, 
all of those work really well together. They're very complementary textures, even though they're different textures in and of themselves. Uh, in terms of the image structure, the foreground doesn't have a whole lot of visual interest. Um, so either placing something there that doesn't block the buildings would be nice or cropping out the foreground. So if you imagine recropping this image to something like a 16 by nine, like a widescreen uh, perspective, if you brought the bottom up to where it was just slightly below the shadow that of the chickens that are in front of that first building, at least I think those are chickens. If you brought the bottom up to right below those, then you would take out all of the elements in the foreground that are distracting from the structure of the buildings. And having a wider aspect ratio for an image like this, where the subject spans left to right, can really be complementary to the overall shape of the subject, which is longer than it is tall. So um, again, really fairly minor things I'd suggest looking at as alternatives to the way that the current image is structured because like I've said throughout this video, the submissions for this video for this category have consistently and, and were consistently good. So here's an image that uh, we'll talk about the cropping on this one as well. This was one I really liked. And the honestly, there are there are two things that kept this out of the top five. One is that the sign is there and that's a distracting element because of the text on it. And the second is that the focus is spot on for the wall, but the aperture is small enough that the subject's face is some very, 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 very slightly out of focus. So I like that this was taken on film. One thing you'll notice along the top here from a technical perspective is there are these uh, droopy bits up at the top. That's bromide drag. And what that's telling you is that your agitation is too vigorous with this. I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's developer surge. It's not bromide drag, I screwed that up. That is developer surge. And what happens is when you have very vigorous developing or sh agitation when you develop, developer goes through the perforations in your 35 millimeter film. And because of the difference in velocity of the developer at the film next to the perforations versus the rest of the image, the developer uh, is more active in the uh, places where there is surge. And that's why you end up with surge marks. So um, that's just a sign to tell you to chill out your agitation. When I do my agitations with my film that I developed myself, in the first minute, I do constant agitations and I'd shoot for 10 to 12 full rotations in that minute, about five to six seconds per rotation with the tank. I know from that with my agitation style, if I agitate 17 times in that first minute, I'm probably going to have surge marks in my 35 millimeter. Then when I hit every one minute, it's um, a little, it's, it's the same speed. It's three inversions, takes 15 seconds once a minute. So five seconds per inversion again. Um, so there's that. And then the other thing, if you cr if if this image were to be recropped, let's say, so that you had the left side of the frame almost touching this dude's clothes and then coming up here and then the top of the frame going right above the top of the sign, um, that would get rid of the surge marks. It would get rid of your interference circles up here in the top right that are coming from your flatbed scanner. And um, it would emphasize the subject's placement in the frame by making them relatively larger to it. So uh, love the composition. I love the expression on the subject. I think that's really fantastic. It's a great capture for the subjects, uh, for the subject. And I think that as a photo, um, as a, the important parts of the photo, which are how you're capturing the subject and how you're structuring it are pretty good. All right, so this is a photo that's showing a really good and interesting use of converging lines and shape in the image. And basically 
the image is structured so that it's it's looking up at the building and the building just becomes a triangle with a fence and that fence because of the cropping is a triangle and then the um the stringer bar on top of the fence that holds the barbed wire is pointing at an angle and again forming kind of an invisible triangle with the support for the fence and also with the horizontal beam for the fence so uh i think that the use of triangles and shape in this image are really really interesting and really good and the photographer who took this also took one of the photos we took to talk, we talked about with the leaded glass in the previous i think same photographer in the previous one of the previous videos and i found the consistency across the images from this from the same photographer of the the use of a tight crop uh very compelling it's really hard to consistently or even once in a while quite frankly to create an image with a really narrow angle of view that that photographs a part of a thing and gives a sense of the entirety of the thing it's a hard task to accomplish and uh, across this photographer's submissions it was it was done effectively so really enjoyed this photo and how it used shape and then tonal contrast and then either grain or digital noise as a texture within the image because realistically the subject elements of this image have no texture of their own so uh so here we are on the singapore waterfront and this image i think is a really great commentary on the way that people look at the world now everyone's looking at or well they're using cameras but Lots of people just use their phones and they spend their time looking at their screens on their phones instead of the amazingness that is right in front of them. And added to that, we're behind these guys doing the exact same thing. The photographer who took this picture was looking at the screen, on, well, or maybe the viewfinder on their camera when they took this photo, doing exactly what these, these two guys are doing. So uh, I found this, this image to be really really clever in that regard and a uh, very enjoyable commentary on what people do when they are looking at a scene the um it's also a really good juxtaposition because on the right side we have uh this really happy person who's smiling and very happy to be out in the sun and exploring the waterfront and then on the far left we have a guy who is totally ready to be sitting in the shade of a cafe awning drinking tea he is done with whatever he's been doing for the last however many hours. So um, really good commentary on, on the subjects and a really good, even if, if it was accidental, contrast of the very happy person posing for photos and the person who's clearly tired of the photos being posed for. All right, so here's a street photo and... Um, I forget if we've talked about it in other videos. If not, I know we're going to be talking about it more in the, the last video this week. Structuring an image where your subjects face away from you inherently saps your image of some of the interest. And the reason is because when we engage with people, we engage with them to their face. If you think about the conversations you have with people, when you're talking to somebody and facing them, it's more likely to be a conversation that's happy and beneficial than if you're talking to someone who has turned their back on you. So just from a, a viewer mindset and perspective standpoint, uh, viewers will always be more interested in images where, not always, there are, there are exceptions. You guys are going to kill me when the winner of the overall contest that's a subject that's facing away from the camera. I know it. At any rate, that's going to be an exception that proves me wrong on this. But in general, the um, if having a subject face to you, toward you, uh, will give you a stronger interaction between your viewer and your subject. Now, even if only one of these two uh, girls in the angel costumes had been turned around, or if they were looking at each other, or something like that, it would have it would have changed the interaction between the viewer and the subject. That said, 
I do really, really dig the um, contrast between the darkness of their clothes and the brightness of their wings and halos, and of course the darkness of their hair. That element of the image is really very well executed and took a really good eye to look at the scene and say, that's an interesting thing to take a picture of. So uh, to that end, I might suggest a tighter crop on this image would, would take out some also, there are some extraneous compositional elements around the side, some distracting elements like the rest of the people. And while that's good for setting scene, bringing in a slightly tighter crop to keep some of that, but also give the primary subjects a larger percentage of the image real estate could uh, could be beneficial as well. If maybe not, but at least worth playing around with a little bit. Also, one other thing going on in this photo. Basically, everything is in pairs. You've got the pair of the girls in the angel costume, then they're in the middle, so you have a pair of street of other people in the street, one group on one side, one group on the other. You've got a pair of things on either side of the street, buildings on the left, buildings on the right. So uh, there's a whole lot of things going on that are equal and dual in this. And I, I also found that element of the image to be very interesting. Wow, this is a long video. All right, so let's take a look at the photos of the two people who are making the... Tamales. I think that's what those are. I think those are tamal. Um, okay. There's a lot that I really like about this photo. And the corrections that I would suggest in it are incredibly minor. So I really love the way that the subjects are captured, the way that they're working together, uh, the lighting in the scene is absolutely wonderfully well captured. And your depth of field is spot on and perfect. Just, it's just all of the tech, technical stuff here is really, really well executed. So, and also a good eye for inter, an interesting scene. Now, one thing here that is throwing this image off a little bit is if you look, look at the verticals and the horizontals, and it definitely feels like we are like on a ship that's been hit by a big wave, right? So everything is sort of slanted here. Part of that is that the camera looks like it was actually at a bit of an angle, but a major part of that is that the, the photographer was at a slight angle. So basically what I mean is that the, the, the photographer's shoulders were not perfectly perpendicular with the lines of the table the, that are vanishing away from us. So, uh, how to fix that? A really minor crop would do a lot here. So if you imagined this image and we rotated it so that this, the door jam that we can see over the woman's shoulders was vertical, that's going to do about 90% of our work. So that's going to make the verticals vertical, uh, might throw off the refrigerator over here a little bit, um, might have to kind of split the difference a little. But at any rate, then the uh, other thing I would do is tighten up the crop a little bit. So on the left side, bring the crop line in just past or at the uh, cupboard here. So taking out this, what looks like distilled vinegar uh, over here on the left would take out this very bright element in what's otherwise a very dark area. So when you have a very bright element in a dark area, it draws the viewer's eyes to that. Over here on the left with that bottle, that's the distraction. Over here in the middle where you have their hands and their arms and shirts and the tablecloth, underneath this very dark area that is another room, it works beautifully. So bring in the crop on the left a little bit. When you, when you if you were to re-angle this so that the verticals were vertical, bring the crop down from the top a little bit and take out this striped thing up on top of the fridge, again, another distracting element because you've got this large white space here in this fridge and then a darkness on top of it and that smooth line at the top of the fridge feels natural. But the barber pole thing up here now becomes a distraction. Uh, also, I'd bring in the crop on the right just slightly, not much, but the big one to do is bring up the crop on the bottom. So if you brought the bottom of the frame up here so that it was above this chair, 
and maybe parallel with a slightly higher corner of the table. So it went across. So it, it, the bottom of the image was this slightly higher corner. Then what you would do is you would cut out this chair, which is a distracting element in the front of the image. You would have the table ending at the bottom of the image, which would make the viewer feel more like they're standing right at it. And it would um, also force you to have the left side brought in a little bit and it would take out, it would, it would help take out some of those distracting elements. But realistically, when we talk about images, it's like, oh, hey, here's a minor crop thing you can do. That's saying you've nailed the important parts of the image, the stuff that's very hard to learn. And now it's just a matter of being, learning to be a harder judge on some of the framing and technical issues. So um, that's the easy part. Here's a shot that I looked at for quite a while because I couldn't figure, up, figure out for a long time if we were looking up at something and the image was rotated or if we were standing on like a sidewalk or a, uh, an elevated platform like a, the, like a mezzanine level of another building looking out at something. And uh, there's a little shadow there in the bottom left going between two of these areas that I... I suspect is a vertical lamppost shadow. And so I think I have decided, correct me if I'm wrong, that we are, that this is the correct image orientation and we are looking like down a city block at this building. I really love the use of repeated shapes and how it's not a perfect repetition. There are places in here where the pattern breaks. And also the tones are different in different places on this image. Really, absolutely enjoyed the structure and the rigidity and the uniformity and from a design aesthetic standpoint really really solid what's a challenge in this image is just the angle at which it was taken because the camera is pointed a little bit up and the uh that means that this vertical over here on the left is not perfectly vertical so i can't tell if the image is cropped i'm assuming it is to make the verticals on the right vertical the one on the left, if you were to work with this in Photoshop and just skew it or keystone it a little bit so that this vertical on the left was, was vertical or off frame would, would be great. If you wanted to do it in the dark room, you could correct a little bit of it by angling your paper holder. And, and that would also give you a little bit of, of control in that regard. Anyway, those are, those are minor things that don't have to be fixed. Um, I really just really greatly enjoyed the repeating pattern and the image structure and how filled this entire frame was. And it really felt like if somebody was looking for a design inspiration, like they said, I want to make a really interesting design for a box camera or a book cover, like a physics book cover or something like that. This would be a really good inspiration for that. This was a shot that I struggled with a lot because it was, because the subject of the shot is the lights. And it's, it's interesting in that the lights are different, but the subject needs to have more to say than that. And so what I ended up looking at was the rest of what's surrounding the image. And I really came to appreciate some of the image elements in this and the way they're used together. So this is one of those examples where not having horizontal verticals really works well. And the reason is because take out the lights and you've got a pretty good abstract form. Also a really good use of texture and of tone. It is a very high contrast image. There's not a whole lot in the grayscale, but there's the use of very light and very dark is very effective. Also, if we're looking at shape and texture, white, no texture, strong white triangle, black, no texture, strong black line that mirrors the angle of the triangle. In the middle of them is basically the only area with a grayscale gradation in it of the eaves overhang. And it's a very hard, rigid line that touches both of those bright white and bright dark places. So that's a very interesting shape from an image structure uh, perspective. Now we go down to the wood, contrasting to those areas that have either a smooth and in, in the eave or no texture whatsoever. Now we have the wood, which has a very defined grain. 
also a very wavy base. So if you look at the hard line going along the wood here, then that contrasts to the very hard and sharp lines that we were just talking about a moment ago. So I found those things really absolutely fascinating, the way that those contrast. And I thought that those were very strong image elements and that take out the light, take out the what I assume is a grounding cable over here. Uh, this image would be a really strong abstract form and tone image that uh, would have a lot of very good visual interest. All right, so uh, this photo is a really interesting photo that shows a really good take on picking a subject. So what we have here is, um, not sure which mythological f figure that would be, looks sort of like he's laughing as his head's popping out of the wall. Now, and this is another one of the cases that we will see exceptions to, of course, throughout this, these videos, where having the verticals askew really works well for the image. And the reason that it works well is because uh, there's a, this whole sort of semi-surreal sense to the image. And that's made by the face. If there were a different expression on the, on the, uh, the sculpture, the, the bust or whatever, I'm blanking on the name of what that, act, that architectural feature is, if it had a different expression, having the camera at an angle like this wouldn't work like it does now. So um, I think this is a really good use of tilting the camera to create a sense that is um, surrealistic in nature and disorienting because that mirrors the focus of the photo. Good use of the tonal range. It's more toward, it's, it, there's not a whole lot of highlight blown out, a whole lot of it, the very light tones. Mostly it's the darker grays and uh, a few areas of, of black. And that works really well for this subject as well because it gives a sense of um, sort of darkness and brooding. Looks like this photo was taken on a very cloudy day and uh, that will contribute to having a lower dynamic range like this image ex uh, exhibits. All right, so we're back to what looks like more surge marks on the film here. And um, so along the bottom looks like surge marks and then there's some vertical lines uh, across the image plane that could be bromide drag. So um, it looks kind of like this image was in a roll of film that was both agitated very vigorously and then stand developed. Um, so, so those technical issues are, I mean, they're, they're overcomable in future images, but they're not fixable readily in this one. And that's too bad because this is an interesting image. So at first I looked at this and like, wow, that's really muddy and grainy. I wonder what happened there. But then as I looked at it, I, I thought, I, I bet that was intentional because from an image aesthetic standpoint, the grain in the film and the general lack of of contrast in the film, in the image, really mirrors the beach. The beach has a lot of sand grains. It's kind of one tone. I mean, if you got, you, you could argue there are lots and lots of tones and colors, and there are, but if you stand far enough away from beach, it becomes pretty much one color. So in that way, the image reflects, the, the medium reflects the subject. And then really well done. You get some detail on the clouds out here in the sky. Really nice, crisp, and level horizon line, and some visual interest in the shape of the shoreline, which is curved, and the way that the waves are curved opposite of it. And then the people walking away into the towards the horizon in different groups of one or two, and getting smaller at fairly even intervals. I ended up really enjoying the, the overall structure of this image quite a bit and some of the way that the medium was used to complement the image scene. So here's a really interesting image that again shows the if the if the subject is walking away from you 
it's going to steal image interest from your viewers. Now, I know that it is insanely popular on a, on a very, very well-known image sharing web service to have a picture of a person standing facing away from the camera and looking out at a dramatic scene. Let us all purge that image aesthetic from our minds in unison. What I want you to see here is what this image could have been if the subject was walking towards the photographer and a little bit closer. There's a lot that's right in this image. It conveys a really solid sense of place and of structure, and not just because this is taken within a very well-defined structure. There are strong verticals and strong horizontals and strong shapes backed up by a very, very solid contrast profile. Lots of darks, lots of whites, not a whole lot in between. All the tones are hit in places. So those things are really neat. Let's assume that this was a model, right? If the model had been walking towards the photographer and then what's probably about seven feet between uh, away from the, you know, from the model towards the photographer is a small spot of light on the left side. It's like a little pair of lights. If the, if the subject or the model had been walking towards the photographer and when they got there, their face was illuminated by that light coming through the structure on the left side of their frame, then that would have caused the subject to be illuminated facially and also to have blended in with the scene and sort of become one with the shadows that the scene is creating. Uh, so a lot of things going right here. One of the, and again, like we've talked about with almost every photo in this video, one really small change just to adjust some part of the image to give it a little bit more viewer interest and Every, any, almost any of the photos that we've talked about so far could have, uh, could have won this contest, uh, this, this uh, category because all of the photos in here were such good uses of the black and white prompt, and this one included. This last one before we get to the top five is a really good and interesting portrait, and I, str I really struggled with this sh shot a lot when I was looking at these because my knee-jerk reaction is to say, too much contrast and get out the spray bottle. But um, as I looked at it more, I thought, you know, it really suits the subjects well. Because on the right side, we've got a person who's probably got slightly darker skin tone than the person on the left. Let's assume they're mom and daughter. And the person on the right also has a, a greater amount of texture in their skin than the one on the left. And so the contrast really pulls out both of those very beautifully. And then the dark shadow between them, I think does a whole lot to show their connection because they are both sharing that shadow. So, uh, and also I think that the little, uh, the little flecks of dust on the film really add a whole lot to the overall atmosphere of the image. So I think that's really neat. Now that said, if I were to go into this photo and there are a couple things I would do. I might try to pull back some of the darks in the hair on the woman on the right, only to give it a little bit of texture. And then the other thing would be to recrop it a little bit. So let's imagine this as a four by five crop. So five wide, four high. We're not going to pull the top and bottom in at all. We're just gonna pull the left and right in. If we pull the right side in until it's just a hair to the left, of that first vertical line in the wallpaper, that one that has a little white fleck in it, just a little bit to the left. You'll cut off a little bit of the shoulder there, but that's okay because this hard dark line on the right side where the shadow from the light source is being cast is actually a bit of a distraction, as well as the piece of furniture that's in the bottom right corner that you can see just a little bit of. Now bring it over in the left here, and there's this very bright, blown out highlight in the shirt. And there is still some detail in the shirt because of the pattern, but if we brought the left in and cropped out most of that highlight, say if we brought it into, there's a, uh, there's one of these little four pointed things where the, it's point oriented vertically on her shoulder. If you brought the, cr the, the left side of the frame in to split that, now what you've done is taken out that highlight but you've also 
given the subjects more real estate within the image itself. And that gives them even more importance to the overall image. Plus, because they're taking up more of it together, it re-emphasizes what we talked about with that shared shadow, showing the connection that they share. So, 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 so many things in this image going very, very right. Uh, very compassionate, very thoughtful image here. And in general terms, very well executed. I mean, like I said, the, the number of things where it's like, oh yeah, just recrop this very slightly, see how that looks to your eye throughout this whole video uh, should be a sign that I, what I've said here consistently, I am super, super impressed by the quality of images that everybody submitted for the black and white category. All right, let's take a look at the top five. So we'll start with the honorable mentions here. All right, so I am forgetting the name of the type of thing that it's called where you take a piece of photo paper and you just uh, put objects on photogram. That's it, photogram. All right, so this is not a photogram. And I spent a good half an hour looking at this photo because I really struggled with how it was made. I love this image composition and the image overall, by the way. Really liked the use of dark and light, but here's the thing. It's not just black and white. You have grayscale in the dandelion along the stem and in the head. So there's a lot, there's still that sense of depth and shape. What I could not figure out conclusively was whether somebody, the, the photographer here, whether or not they had, let's say, a couple of flashes and reflectors set up, and then they dropped this stuff in front of their camera and then just took a series of photos and kept this one because they liked the structure of it the best. Or if this is a very intentional composition where it's, say, on a piece of glass with a couple of flashes or lights angled off to the side to eliminate the reflection and a very, very dark blanket a couple of feet below it to create that inky blackness behind what we're seeing. I think it was the latter, but I'm totally open to the possibility that I could be wrong. And I think it was the latter because in general, the dandelion seeds are all on their side. There are a couple of exceptions to that, but there are more, many, 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 many of more of them are on their side than not, which I wouldn't expect to see if they were dropped. I'd also expect them all to be oriented the same way, seed down, parachute up, if they were dropped. Um, and also, it would just be a whole lot easier to do this if everything was stationary. And there's no mo motion blur in anything, which would be expected if there was... Um, even a shot like this, if there were multiple flashes. Really captivating image, very well structured creatively, and uh, I found this to be incredibly pleasing. So we talked about the windmills in I think the first video or the single windmill. Here's a really exceptional execution of that technique. And this was one of my favorite photos from the whole contest. If I had this hanging on my wall, I would tell company that I took it. So, a wonderful use of black and white. Wonderful use of tonality. The way that the blades of the windmills cast a shadow on themselves in the top left of each of them makes them just blend into the background, just become part of it. Really beautiful in that regard. The, I love the image structure. Everything front to back is completely sharp and in focus. That's really exceptionally well done. Um, also, the image composition and just the way that the windmills are placed, really, really good eye for taking an existing scene and structuring it as an incredibly successful photo. The only things I would change about this image... In the foreground, there are a couple of bushes. One is basically dead center, and one is over on the right. So these, these, this image this image here confirms my, my belief that the previous one and this one were taken with multiple images that were composited in post. The bushes are blurry. 
and that becomes a distracting element because everything else is so darn sharp. So for were, were it me making this image, not just telling all my friends that I took it, um, I would take one individual frame out of this composite that has that bush in it or those two bushes, and then I would trace around those, mask it out, drop it in over those bushes so that the bushes would become perfectly still surrounded by the motion the the many times over captured motion of the windmills um but that's a super nitpicky comment i mean this is such a wonderful image all right this cabin on the shore Whew. wow so this is one of the most visceral images from the entire competition in terms of the way that it creates a tangible scene. And what I mean by that is what we've talked about with the use of textures throughout. Look at the tones and the textures in this image. The composition is exceptional. Very pleasing composition, very beautiful image structure, wonderful use of the entire range of gray tones in this image. Uh, the, I, I went, I'm, it was so hard to pick the top two in this category because I went back and forth with all five of these and at different points, I'm like, no, that's going to be the winner. No, no, it's got to, no, I wanted to, this was, this is such an incredible photo. Um, again, sharp front to back, wonderful use of scene structure, perfect technically great capture of the cloud detail of the reflection, which is perfectly smooth. It, the, the cabin just really is, is such a beautiful part of the scene. Um, another image I would, I would tell people I took for sure. Second place for this category, Santander. I don't know. I, I like this shot a lot. So here is a shot where we talked about in the one, a few images ago, the person walking down that structure and how if they had been in a different place in a different orientation, it would have looked like they were bleeding into or becoming one with the shadows of their surrounding. Take a look at the guy here in this shot. Even though he's not, he's facing perpendicular to the camera, that's completely okay for this structure, which is very much a side-on image. He completely, well, almost completely, blends into the shadows that are cast by whatever is off the uh, image frame that are in front of this building. So we have the visual interest of this guy blending into the shadows, casting his own shadows, also his face being illuminated by light. Um, horizontals and verticals spot on, very, very good. The, the image structure of the building also, the way that it, the, the, and what I mean by that is the way that the building is placed in the frame is really exceptional. So, um, also very glad that the framing did not cut off half of the Santander word on the left. That would have bugged the heck out of me. One other thing I really want to point out here is how hard an exposure this would be to get. You've got very bright light in the walkway. Look through the windows in the second floor and you can make out the interior lighting. It's much dimmer, but you can see the shape of the interior lights. So really, really hard exposure to capture like this. So exceedingly well done from an image composition and structure standpoint and from a technical standpoint, which leaves us with the winner of this category. Wow. I mean, that guy really says everything. He looks exhausted. Now he's way too clean to have not, you know, to, to be f finishing his day. If he is actually working on those locomotives, I, we have locomotives here, steam locomotives that go from Georgetown to Silver Plume. I had a really interesting conversation after I filmed my 7.30 hike video with um, the head of the maintenance yard, whose daughter runs those locomotives. And man, uh, he was only a couple hours into his day and he looked like he had bathed in coal dust. Probably did. So this guy's expression is just one of, oh man, I got to go fix the cylinder head again or whatever he's off to do. And 
he looks like he is just really worn and uh, just and weary. And the the his structure and, and the, the textures in the subject contrast and, and the tones in the subject contrast so much with the textures and the tones and the locomotive behind him. Uh, I think that is a really great juxtaposition of both of both texture and tone. Normally, blurry foregrounds bother the heck out of me. Um, in this case, it doesn't. I think it really contributes to this image. It doesn't make it, but I think it contributes a lot to this image because it gives a sense of depth and scene that I think without the blurry foreground would be missing and wouldn't make this as strong of an image. So no complaints here. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful image. Wonderful use of darkness and lightness and shadow and light and just exceedingly well uh, executed. So that's it for the black and white category. The last category will be negative space. We'll talk about that one tomorrow and we're doing that one last because the overall winner of the overhauled Pentax K1000 is in that category as well as uh, first and second place for that category. So we will come back uh, tomorrow and see who has taken the, pr the top prize.